Welcome to our seminar. And today's seminar is on patent boxes and success rate of patent application. Presenter is Ronald Davis from University College Dublin. And the presentation is based on a paper that is co-authored with Ryan Hines and Dita F. Kogla, if I was pronouncing the names correctly. So this event is part of the series Seminars in International Economics. Uh, which is jointly organized by the Vienna Institute for International Economic Studies in cooperation with Research Center in International Economics or FIW. And these seminars in international economics are intended to be a forum for presentations and discussion of current research findings in the field of international economics with major topics on international trade policy, FDI and migration. So about this presentation, I have to say that the event will take about 30 to 40 minutes and we will have about 20 minutes discussion afterwards. Uh, so you have the opportunity to ask your questions in the chat function. So if uh, the question is very pressing and it needs to be answered in the middle of the, the presentation, I will unmute myself and ask Ron to answer the question. Otherwise, I will keep the questions for the end of the session so that you can yourself unmute your microphone and ask your own question and uh, put your comments. And um, at the end of the event, there will be an online survey which will be sent, sent by email to you so that you can provide your own evaluation on this presentation and on this webinar. And also, I have to say that this session is being recorded and at the end, uh, because Ron also allowed us, we will upload this um, presentation, this webinar on, on our YouTube channel. And in order to introduce Ron, so many of you uh, know Ron from various trade or economic conferences. Ron Davis is, uh, has been a professor of economics at University College Dublin since 2008. After earning his PhD at uh, Pennsylvania State University in, 19, uh, in, in 99, he joined the University of Oregon faculty where he remained until uh, relocating to Dublin where he is currently the head of School of Economics. So he specializes in trade and foreign direct investment. He has a particular focus on the tax and trade policies that affect globalization. And uh, he, he has been publishing in various journals. He's also um, associate editor and editor of several journals that uh, are bold in his CV. So uh, Ron, the floor is yours. Cool. All right. So uh, this is joint work with Dieter Kogler, who is Austrian, by the way. So uh, he's quite jealous I get to present this for the first time in Austria, um, as well as Ryan Hines, who is one of my PhD students. Um, and before I actually get onto the paper, let me just sort of plant an idea in your head, because if you wrap your head around this idea, then you'll understand exactly what we're looking for in the paper. So, you know, at the WIOW, so, you know, Robert runs the research side of things. So suppose that your boss comes to you, Robert comes and he says, look, from now on, every paper that you publish in a top field journal, Journal of International Economics, Journal of Public Economics, I'm going to give you a 10,000 euro bonus. How would you respond to that kind of incentive? Well, you know, one way you could respond is like, you know, okay, you've got this paper, it's ready to go. You were thinking about sending it to JPUB, but you didn't, you don't know if it's really good enough. Do I really sit around for six months to get rejected? Maybe I'll just go to International Tax and Public Finance, which you should because it's an awesome journal. And I don't say that just because I'm the editor. Um, you know, but you know, okay, I was gonna send it to ITAX. Maybe I'll roll the dice and just send it to JPUB and maybe I get lucky. So one way you might respond is where you choose to submit your stuff. Um, and, and it's based on what you thought the likelihood of success was. Now, the second thing you might do is you might actually work a little bit harder on the application process. So most of the time when people write letters uh, to submit a paper, it's please publish this paper, thanks. And that's the extent of the cover letter. Um, 
Maybe you put actually a little bit of time into crafting a cover letter that explains what it's about and gives ideas about who would be good referees. Um, or maybe you actually hire somebody to go through the language of the paper to talk about, to, to help sort of with the English of it. Um, I've only ever done that once with one paper. And it was kind of a humbling experience because I always assumed I was a good English speaker. Um, but until I hired a professional editor for that one paper, no, it turns out I, my English is actually not that great. Um, so maybe you put more effort into the application process. Um, but the third way you might respond, and this is probably the whole point of this kind of incentive scheme, is you put more effort into research. You work a little bit harder, maybe write some additional papers to throw them at the wall, see if they stick. And any given paper, maybe what you do is you put more time into developing that given research idea to improve it. You go out and you dig up a couple of extra variables. You extend the data to bring it forward a couple of years in time. And so you, you increase the amount of effort that goes into the research of it. You produce more and potentially better research because you wanna get it over the line to get it into that top journal in order to get the, the bonus out of it. So there are three ways you might respond to that. And all of those are gonna to relate to the story I'm going to tell about patent boxes and how firms that are innovating respond and how that affects the probability that a given patent application is gonna get over the line, is going to get granted. So what a patent box does is it reduces the corporate income tax rate on qualifying income. And so the way it works is, okay, I have a patent and I argue that this money I earned is because of this patent. Then what happens is that income gets taxed at a lower rate. Usually they cut the corporate tax rate in half. And so again, it's income that's attributed to, and this is important, to a granted patent. So it's not just income to an innovation, but it's one that can be linked to that granted patent. Now, why do governments do this? Um, well, the argument is, is this is intended to increase the amount of innovation that takes place. So, you know, there are various papers out there that have looked at the number of granted patents that get produced. And on the whole, they tend to find that it increases the number of granted patents, either by a firm or by a, at the country level, although it's not really necessarily universal. Um, they don't do a whole lot with the quality of granted patents. So Ernst actually looks at, again, granted patents. And what they do is they look at the number of forward citations and some other metrics trying to measure patent quality. Um, and th there might be a bit of a positive effect there. Annette Altstetter and some co-authors look at uh, EPO registrations. So if your patent is granted by the European Patent Office, that doesn't in and of itself get you patent protection in all the different member states. You have to go and register with each additional state, which costs a little bit of extra money. Um, and then you get the protection in, in the different locations. Um, and so, but again, like all of these seem like they increase the amount of innovation going on. Now there are two additional sets of literature that look at sort of essentially profit shifting in multinationals. So um, we do tend to see patents within a multinational being shifted and owned in countries with patent boxes to get that lower rate. This has actually led to what are called nexus requirements, where in order to take advantage of the patent box, you have to do at least a certain amount of the R&D locally. So in Ireland, our patent box, you have to do 70% of the R&D costs of that patent locally in Ireland in order to qualify. Um, and then other people have not looked at really the patent aspect of it, but profit location. And so you tend to find that profits get shifted towards countries that have lower taxes. Part of the way lower taxes might come about are because of patent boxes. Um, and so, you know, this profit shifting is actually kind of a big deal. Um, so if you look at the, the data um, from Torres Love, Veer, and Zuckman, um, they find that about 100 billion in global profits are shifted every year to three countries, Ireland, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. All of them use patent boxes. And you know how much are we sort of losing in terms of tax revenue? They come up with about 16%. So you know these patent boxes, they may well increase innovation, but they are definitely also manipulating the amount of revenues and where profits are showing up. And that has some cost to it. And so what we really need to do is get a sense of, okay, what is happening with the innovation side of it, the benefit of this policy, and how does that compare to these costs? So the focus in the literature to date is on the number of patents. Um, 
Now, the problem with that is that's granted patents, but only about half of applications are ever granted. And applying is not cheap. You know, applying and registering in a handful of EPO countries, that's easily over 100,000 euros. Um, so for a firm to do this, you know, they're taking a bit of a gamble. They're putting money down, hoping it gets over the line. Not only do they get the patent protection, but they also might get this lower tax rate. And if you instead look at, rather than the number of granted patents where their effects are almost always positive, if you look at the number of applications, it's a lot more mixed. And some studies will find negative, some will find positive, some find insignificant impacts. And so what this sort of points to is there might be a bit of a difference between the decision of what to apply and what it gets granted in the end. And in particular, if you start thinking back to the story I told at the beginning, whether you choose to apply, how much effort you put into the application, and how much effort you put into the underlying research, all of those can affect whether a given application is granted, and therefore the success rate of applications. So we're going to look at three different uh, potential effects on that probability a given application is granted. So, you know, one aspect of it is, you know, do you even submit this for patenting at all, given that there's a cost to it? Um, and so the OECD and Bradley raise this as a concern that firms may have really marginal ideas. You know, maybe I would get the patent for this or maybe not. I'm gonna go ahead and apply because if I do, now I get the patent and now I get the patent box and I get that lower tax rate. So it's gonna affect things on the extensive margin and you're gonna submit more marginal ideas with lower probabilities of getting over the line. And therefore the average success rate of application should fall. The other thing you might do is you might spend more on patent prosecution. So when you apply for a patent, you hire patent lawyers who write the application for you. And as with all lawyers, there are some that are really good at what they do, some not so good. And so maybe you increase the quality of the patent prosecution team, the lawyers who help you write this thing up. Um, and so that representative upgrading is going to make a better application, even if the underlying technology is exactly the same, and that could increase the chance of success. And both of those things can happen right away. You know, this idea, oh, was I going to submit it or not? You know, under EPO regulations, you have to submit for patent application at the period of first use or public disclosure. You can maybe get up to about six months of wiggle room on that, but you don't have a whole lot of decisions, either submit it or not now. Um, so it's a pretty immediate effect. The lawyers you hire, that's a pretty immediate effect thing. You can decide that right now. But the third thing you can do is put in more research effort. Try to come up with better, more novel ideas. That's going to increase the probability of getting over the line. That'll increase the probability of success. But that takes a few years to pay off. You know, if somebody tells me, write an AER right now, I can't. You know, first off, could I ever write an AER? But if I could, you know, that takes a while. It takes a few years to pull off. And so that effect we would expect to show up only with a lag after the introduction of the patent box. So what are we going to do? We're going to create a simple model of application decisions just to frame the story. And we're going to estimate the impact of patent box introduction on the success rate of applications to the European Patent Office. We're going to use data from 78 to 2019, but we're going to use an estimation window that's shorter than that. And I'll explain why as we get there. And what we come up with in the end is that when a patent box comes into effect, the probability of a given application being granted goes up by about seven percentage points. That's about a 12% increase over the mean. That's a pretty big effect. Um, but that effect is only found in the top 5% of innovators. So of, uh, of applicants for patents, 5% of innovators submit 19 or more applications over the 40 years of data. A lot of people submit once, ever. The handful that do submit fairly frequently on average every other year, those guys are only 5% of applicants, but make up 75% of applications. Patenting is really a, the, a few big players drive the story. This positive effect shows up only two years after the implementation. And what this suggests is the dominant effect is this research story putting more effort into coming up with more novel ideas. 
The corporate tax rate has no significant impact. And the B index, which is kind of the opposite of R&D subsidies to the cost of doing R&D, they don't seem to have an impact either. It's really the, this patent box that does it. And I'll explain more about that as we get there. And so, you know, if you're looking at trying to spur innovation, what does this suggest? If you throw a patent box into place, you're probably going to lead to more successful applications, which seems to be driven by better research, better innovations, but it's only going to be the handful of the big guys that are going to benefit from this. So um, there is a side literature out there on the success rate of patent applications overall. Um, their big focus is on home bias. So in the European Patent Office, European Patent Office countries, submissions from there do better. The USPTO, American firms have a home advantage as well. So that's been a big part of their story. And none of the literature on that side of things looks at tax policy at all and how that might influence the incentives to apply for patents and what that might mean for the success rate. So I'm gonna kind of skip over the model a little bit um, just in the interest of time. But sort of the basic idea is you take a firm and a firm's got a bunch of decisions to make. How many research projects do I start? For each research project, how much effort do I put into developing it? Now, now that I know how good, you know, which ones look like they're winners, which don't, which ones do I apply for a patent? How much work do I put into each application? And so there are these four levels of decision, the number of projects, effort per project, which determines the novelty, whether or not to apply for a patent, and then how much to sink into the application process. So, you know, there's going to be some costs to doing this that depends on the total number of patents you develop, or total number of projects you develop. Some of those costs are going to be decreasing in size. So big firms have access to credit or have reserves they can draw on to pay for that upfront cost of the R&D process. And that's a big distinction between R&D subsidies, which are an ex ante cost incentive to do R&D, and patent boxes, which are an ex post income incentive. And so, you know, for a small firm, yeah, they may earn more, get to keep more of their money later on the line, but for them, the big barrier might be doing the R&D today. How do I get the money to do the R&D today? And so there's a distinction there between that cost-based incentive and the ex post patent box kind of incentive. Now, each innovation comes up with a novelty level. N, and that's drawn randomly from a distribution. But the more research effort you put into that given innovation, which again is going to be easier for big firms, what you do is you change the probability of coming up with a good idea. You shift the overall distribution. So the more effort you put into a given project, the better the chance you come up with a winner with a highly novel idea. So if you don't have a granted patent, either because you didn't apply or you weren't successful, there's a probability someone's going to steal your idea. You put all the costs into it, but you get no revenues out of it. If you do apply for a patent, you choose how much money to put into the application. And the probability of the application being granted is increasing in novelty. More novel ideas are more likely to be granted. And it's increasing into the amount of money you put into the application process. Hire better lawyers, write a better application, higher probability of success. Oh, and the key thing here is the patent box not only gets your protection, no one can steal your ideas, but you also get a lower tax rate if your application is granted. And so those are the two things that the patent does for you. So if you don't apply, this is the expected profit of an idea. If you do apply, this is the expected profit where really the difference here is this fee term, which is the more, sort of the benefit of getting the, the, the application granted, which is getting rid of the probability of someone stealing your idea. And you get B times T, B is usually one half. So your tax rate gets cut in half. So think of this fee thing here as the benefits of, of, of applying, for, for the app, applying for a patent. So really good ideas, you'll apply. Really lame ideas, you won't bother. Somewhere in there's a marginal cutoff that's gonna depend on the benefits of getting the application through. So a patent box comes into play, what does that do? It lowers the tax rate if you are successful. That has three effects. First thing is, you're going to put more effort into the application. You're going to hire better lawyers. 
We call that representative upgrading, and that can take place straight away. Second thing it do, does is it reduces the threshold novelty. That idea where I wasn't sure whether to submit or not, now I'm going to decide, you know what, if I get lucky, it's worth it, throw it in the mix. So you're going to tend to submit more of those marginally novel ideas. That also has an impact straight away. The third impact is, well, way back at the beginning of the game, I'm going to put more effort into developing the ideas. That then increases the probability that I get a high novelty. And so that's going to then increase success rate, but that's going to take a few years to pay off. Now, the corporate income tax rate and the B index don't have an impact on the submission decisions once you have novelty in place. But the B index, which again is the opposite of subsidies, tends to change research effort. So if you make it cheaper to do R&D, you're going to do more R&D, that might increase the probability of getting a patent through as well. And then these are going to have some impacts on the number of innovation projects. But again, the limit of that is going to be sort of governed by, oops, going the wrong direction. It's going to be governed by those fixed costs. If these fixed costs are really big, then it's going to take a big tax reduction to actually have more innovation projects. So theoretically, that, that effect should be positive on the margin, but may not be very big in practice. So those are the ideas. And so we're going to take this to the data. So we start out looking at data just to the EPO, so applications to the European Patent Office from 78 to 2019. That's about 3.3 million observations, about 46% of which eventually get granted. We're going to restrict ourselves to applications coming from a single country. So if Madi and I submit an application together, we're joint owners, we're going to get rid of that one because I don't know who has tax jurisdiction there so much and therefore whether or not the patent box would apply. So I'm just going to shave that off. And that's about 100,000 applications. Then we're going to restrict ourselves to applications from EPO member countries. Um, and again, the reason why is this home bias story. Americans have a harder time patenting in Europe than Europeans do. And then we're also going to restrict ourselves to applications coming from companies. And so we're not going to include governments or applications coming from individuals or universities. Um, the reason why, especially individuals, this is a corporate tax policy, not a personal income tax policy. Um, and governments and universities and hospitals probably aren't as motivated by profit considerations. And so it's just potentially a different animal. So we're going to shave those out of there as well. So that leaves us with about 1.4 million applications in the end. Uh, about 55% of those get through. And again, you can see by getting rid of the EPO, non-EPO countries, the success rate goes up quite a bit. That's that home bias I was talking about. So these are the countries in the data. Um, what's really kind of important to take away from this, some have patent boxes, some don't. Um, there's two countries, Ireland and France, have patent boxes really early. Um, Ireland's a weird one. During the crisis, we got rid of our patent box in 2010. We brought it back in 2016. There are a few countries in here, the UK in particular, that add patent boxes later in the day, but the countries introducing patent boxes are basically after 2000. So we're going to start our estimation window in 2000 because there's no real useful variation prior to that. Um, but we're also going to end the sample in 2012, and I'll explain why in just a second. Um, and that's because of truncation. So from PatStat, if you look at the number of patent applications, you can see there's a fall off right near the end of the sample. Again, you can see that the majority of applications are coming from just the 5% most frequent applicants. Um, and this end of sample truncation is just a feature of PatStat. Everyone's aware of it. The other problem you kind of run into though is there's truncation and success rate around about 2013, it really starts to drop off. Why then? The average application takes five years and about three months to get through if it's going to get through in our data. So once you get towards the end of the data, something submitted in 2016, maybe it just hasn't had time to work itself through the process yet. So you end up with an end of sample truncation, not because it didn't get granted, but because it hasn't been granted yet. And so that's why we're going to chop things off in 2012. We'll also do robustness checks, chopping things off in 2011, 10, and 2009. The other thing you can see is this gap between the top 5% and the bottom 95% in terms of success has shrunk over time. 
there seems to be a little bit more of a level playing field as you go on. Um, that's what I just said. Um, so, you know, in terms of the, the average days to granting, you know, there, there is that end of sample truncation time. Um, one of the things, if I have time, I will show you at the end is we did look at the impact of patent boxes on the average time to granting. It shortens it by about eight days out of 1900 days and it's insignificant. So basically, they're not screwing with how long it takes, which makes sense because the EPO is a Europe-wide thing, whereas patent boxes are country-specific. So what do we pull off of patents? Um, from, we pull sorry, off, one, yeah. one question I have. Yeah, go ahead. Exactly from the previous chart that you showed. Uh, so if I'm a firm and I'm registering a patent in the patent office for a specific innovation that I'm not sure it will be granted, Will I increase my production or if it is a pro product innovation, will I increase my pr production exactly from the day that I registered or yep, from the day that I patented? There's no incentive to wait. And the reason why is you can go on to Google and you can look at any patent application submitted right now. So, so once you submit, patent applications become public knowledge. Then, so yeah, you can wait until it gets granted to start making your whatever, but why? Everybody already knows your idea now. So you will produce. Yeah. I, but, but in terms of the patent box, they will uh, return the tax after the uh, grant of the patent or from the day that the- depend, Depends a little bit by country. Some it's only when it's granted. Others Sorry, maybe, maybe I can I can interfere yeah. at this point of time because uh, I think it's not quite correct. Um, you know what the mm -hmm. others have patented when it is published, not when it is submitted, and uh, it might take some time I, up until um, eighteen months uh -huh. uh, from the submission. So there is a time lag in there. There, there, there is a bit of a time lag, but yeah. it's not like it's a five-year time lag. Sure. Yeah. So after submission, it takes in average five to 5.3 years for, for the patent to be granted, if granted. On average, if. Yeah, and if there is a patent box, they will return the tax on the revenue of the company from the date of the submission or from the date of publishing or from the date of granting. It depends on the country. Some patent boxes, it's only once it's granted, full stop. Others will say, even if it's just in the application phase, we'll let you use the lower tax rate now. What we have not been figured, able to figure out yet is what they do if you don't get it granted. Do they come looking for the money? Do they grandfather it? We haven't got a straight answer from governments about that yet. Mm -hmm. and so we don't have anything about that feature of patent boxes in the paper. You know, my point is because five years is pretty long and this is the average, so it may take even longer. And the product exactly. that I innovated five years ago is outdated today. So I will not produce any further and I will not seek market share gain. You know? uh, I, I would disagree with that because it's, you know, once it becomes public, which as Mariana said, takes a little bit of time, what, what's the incentive to wait to use your idea? Someone could say, oh, I see that now on the shelf. Let me go look up the, the, the technology. You know, th there is an entire literature out there about whether or not to even attempt a patent because it forces your hand and discloses tech proprietary technology. Yeah. Right. And it is still another factor as well. Um, as soon as you have filed an application, let's say some, some two or three months later, the office you have filed to makes a research and is able to tell you whether your invention is new in principle. It can tell you whether it's going to be patented or not, but there is a good hint for you whether it's new and inventive, and then you can probably start investing. Yeah. So you know, there's all sorts of questions there. You know, Madi's income, the way I'm interpreting it is as much about the tax liability. If the income, you know, if you don't start earning income till later, what happens? Yeah. Why, why, would you, why would you start earning income until the, the, the patent is granted? That's a good question, um, right. but it's not one that, I'm, that I have the ability to dig into deeply here. Mm -hmm. I see. 
So um, what else do we pull off? So we pull off the filing date. So when it was applied for, um, if it's been granted by the end of the sample, we know when it was uh, granted. We have the applicants. So this is typically the name of a firm in our data. Um, and we know what country they're from. We have the name of the inventors and all of the inventors on there, as well as what country those people are from. Um, not on this particular, uh, here it is, the representative. This is the legal team that wrote it. And we, uh, so we can identify them by name over time. We see uh, international application number. This is sometimes called the family ID. So I can apply for protection in the US, EPO, China, Japan, Korea. So we keep track across those big five offices. How many places did you submit it? Um, and then these are technology codes. And this is what Mariana was sort of hinting at. Um, what the EPO will do is they'll look at your idea and they'll say, this reminds us of these, think of them as like JEL codes. So this seems to fit in these categories. That then is what they use to go and look at the existing knowledge to see whether there's something in the prior art that this is simply you know, too close to those guys. And that they, they can give you an initial indication. And Kiramela actually looks at that initial indication. Does that influence transfers of patents within multinationals at that point? We are using, however, the location of the applicant as who owns it at the time of initial submission. It can be transferred afterwards. We're not digging into that. So the 1.4 million applications we're gonna use come from about 150,000 applicants. So we know what country they're in, the total number of applications they make over the 40 year period. About half of applicants make one application ever. They're not very successful compared to those handful that make applications on you know, at least every other year that make up the majority of applications. And you're gonna see there's a big difference in the patent box effect across those groups. Because we know the name of the applicant, the inventor, and the lawyers, we can look at the prior success rate over the past three years. We also look at five and 10 years. For the teams of inventors, we're gonna use the average across all the inventors. We also use the max out of the team and the same for the legal representatives. And so this last one is trying to control for quality of the lawyers. In terms of other data, we're gonna use the number of technology codes, how many claims of novelty there are in the application, whether the inventor team crosses borders or how many there are, forward and backward citations, standard things from the literature. At the country level, in terms of taxes, we're gonna use patent box dummies. I'm gonna focus on that because it's easy to interpret. We'll also look at how big the tax cut is. We'll use the corporate income tax rate, the B index of so the opposite of R&D subsidies, and then a few other things at the country level that vary by year. We'll include technology, three-digit technology dummies. We'll include either country or applicant fixed effects. And then we're going to include year dummies. So we've got about 650,000 applications in our estimation window, which runs from 2000 to 2012. And again, 2000s because people don't really introduce them until after that. 2012 is because of that end of sample truncation about the time it takes to get it granted. So we're going to do a linear probability model because it's easy to interpret. We're going to cluster our errors two ways at the country level and at the year level. Um, we're also going to use the dynamic diff and diff approach. You'll see that as we get there. And we also did probe it and it's nice and robust to probe it, but linear probability is really easy to interpret. So this is our baseline results. Now, before you go blind, let me focus in on what we're interested in, which are these tax variables. Column one are all of our applications, but not including the lawyer quality, which is missing for some of our observations. What do we get? Patent boxes increase the probability of success. Column two, we add in the lawyer quality, and it is the case that lawyers that have been more successful in the past are correlated with better success of the current application. What do we see? It actually lowers that point estimate there a little bit. Um, what that suggests is the patent box may be correlated with better lawyer teams, representative upgrading, more effort in the application. Now, it is a different sample. So here we restrict ourselves to a single sample, to the same sample, but exclude the lawyers. And again, you can see that that difference there 
isn't the same as this difference. And so it really is about controlling for the lawyers, a potential little bit of omitted variable bias consistent with representative upgrading. Then here we split it between the bottom 95% and the top 5%, and we only get significance in the top 5%. There is a difference in the number of observations because these guys are a lot more active. I'll come back to that in the next slide. Then what we do is we move from country fixed effects to applicant fixed effects. And what do we see? Patent boxes are correlated with better success rates only amongst the big players. Now, that doesn't mean subsidies don't matter. They do, but only for relatively infrequent applicants. And again, if small guys have trouble getting access to the credit or the reserves to do R&D today, hoping they make money later on, patent boxes may not give them the room to do that, but those upfront subsidies might. They don't really seem to influence the, 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 the big guys though. Sorry, Ron, uh, yep. what, uh, what is top five? What is bottom 95? Top 5% is uh, applicants that are in the top 5% of the distribution of total applications over the 40 year window. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and again, half of applicants is one application ever. Uh, we try other splits. I'm going to skip over that just for time, but you get the exact same story out of this. Now with the top five versus the 95, again, there's a difference in sample size. So what we actually did was we took a thousand random subsamples of the top 5% equal to the size of the bottom 95. And what we find is a distribution of coefficients that looks like this. The mean is exactly what you get when you use all of the top 5%. And it's almost always significant, including at the higher levels of significance that we normally look for. Um, so this difference here between the bottom 95, the small guys and the big guys, is a difference in behavior, not sample size. But but you say half of them have only one patent. Half of these guys do. Half of half of the bottom ninety five percent. Correct. Okay. Okay. I see. So, and that's why we do this at the using country dummies rather than applicant dummies because you can see, you know, for a lot of those guys, that applicant dummy just explains everything away. So then the question becomes, all right, it's a positive effect. That could be representative upgrading right away, or it could be greater research effort It's the dominant effect. But that greater research effort should take time to show up. So what we then do is a dynamic diff and diff. Year zero is where the patent box comes into play. And that varies across different countries, including countries that don't introduce it until after the end of our estimation window, like the UK. The bottom 95%, what do you see? No significant impact at all. For the top 5%, this is important. Beforehand, there's no difference between those that are going to introduce patent boxes and those that are not. What does that mean? There is no pre-trend. Patent boxes are not being introduced by countries that see their people getting better. There's no difference in the pre-trend. Year zero comes along, well, that doesn't seem to make any difference. Year one, the point estimate's higher, but it's still insignificant. It takes two years and then really comes into fruition around year three for that impact to really take place. It takes a good two or three years for that patent box to really increase the probability of an application getting through. If it was about lawyers, that should happen straight away. And, and it doesn't. What is the date exactly here? The date is the date of submission, the date of publication. Uh, so this is the year. So this is application submitted in the year the patent box takes effect. So does it mean that after two years, uh, no. the patents af after two years, the patents that are submitted are becoming more significantly granted? Yeah, so think about it this way. Patent box is introduced in 2010, applications submitted in 2010, no different than countries without them. Applications submitted in 2011, no difference from countries without them. Applications submitted in 2012 have a difference mm -hmm. and especially 13, 14, 15. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you submit, you, you introduce a patent box in 2010, I don't we don't actually see a difference in your inventors and mine 
until two to three years later. And that's really more consistent with the story of increased research effort, not better lawyers. Then we go through a whole bunch of robustness checks. Um, you know, the probit estimator, I'm not gonna show that. Um, ending the estimation window earlier. Again, we're worried about that end of sample truncation. So rather than ending in 2012, let's end in 2011. This is just for the top 5%, by the way. Let's end it in 2010, let's end it in 2009. Positive across the board. Now, one thing that is kind of cool is, as you move towards 2009, the point estimate gets smaller and a little bit less significant, but oops. If you remember this graph here, if we end it in 2009, we have fewer observations four to five years after it takes effect. That's why the impact is getting smaller and less significant. And so it's definitely consistent with that story. Uh, we got rid of Ireland because we got rid of our box and reintroduced it, um, do it by different technology classes, um, look at different effects by family size. You get the same consistent story each time. It's a positive effect only for the most frequent inventors, the, uh, I'm sorry, uh, innovators, applicants. The one place where you do find an impact of the bottom 95% is patent boxes increase the probability of success, but only in those applications where they're submitting them to all five of the big patent offices globally. This is where they think this is a winner. You know, I'm gonna patent this thing across the globe. And then patent boxes do seem to have an impact, but that's the only place. But again, what that suggests is the end benefits gotta be really big for a small guy to alter what they do, hoping to get through in five years time and have a granted patent. Then what we're gonna do is look at some conditions of boxes. How big is that tax cut? Is it a broad box or a narrow box? Now, so some patent boxes say any old patent, you get the tax break doesn't matter whether you invented the idea or whether you bought it from someone else. It doesn't matter if it was granted before the box took effect or not. Um, so that's a, a broad box as any old patent will do. A narrow box is it must be submitted after the box takes effect. Um, then again, these nexus requirements. So you have to do your R&D locally. And again, these two things really matter when we talk about multinationals. This is going back to the international issue um, because you know, acquiring patents, transferring it across affiliates, that matters in broad boxes. Doing R&D in one place and then moving it somewhere else for profit shifting reasons, that's where Nexus boxes come into play. So what do we find? Um, oh, and the other thing we should add is with multinationals, remember all of this is the income that you can justify was earned by this patent. How do you do that? My iPhone has, I think like something like a thousand patents in it, something ridiculous. How much is each one worth? No. So what do you do? You argue with the government about it, just like you do with transfer pricing. You know, what price should this be set at for an internal transaction? It's all the same monkey business. And so again, what do we see with transfer pricing? It's the big guys that do it. Where do patent boxes show up? The big guys. I don't think that's a random occurrence. So what do we find in terms of the box conditions? The bigger the tax cut, the bigger the effect as you would expect. And the point estimate is that, you know, the average tax rate cuts 20%. And so the point estimate is exactly spot on as when we use that dummy variable. Um, does the patent cover existing patents or not? Seems like that might have a slightly bigger effect, but it's not super significant. I'm not gonna worry about that one a whole lot. Um, then the nexus requirements. Do you have to do the R&D locally? We actually only find a positive and significant effect for those nexus requirements. Now, you got to take that result with a grain of salt. Non-nexus boxes may still have an impact, but 95% of the applications in non-nexus box countries are all coming from France, who had their patent box since 1971. And so their patent box dummy is essentially their country dummy. And so it's it basically, you can't really pick that out when you're gonna use that country fixed effect in there. And so, you know, although the data says this, it's really, this is where the time series variation is in boxes, not this one over here. So Ron, yeah, Marty, please. once again, what is the dependent variable? Does my patent get accepted one or not? Zero. 
My application. So it means that having a patent box uh, means that the government is seriously considering patents to be granted. Uh, what it means is having a patent box, the applications that go forward, the EPO is more likely to grant. Now, is that because it's a better application, a more novel technology? Mm -hmm. So the EPO is one broad office, which is not, uh, which it, is it not, is. which is not depending on a single single member, right? Correct. It's essentially mm -hmm. the EU plus. Switzerland's in there, uh, Norway, I want to say economic Iceland. area. Yeah, exactly. So, so it is a supra national organization based in Munich. And they have a very nice, cool looking office building. Mm -hmm. I've been there. Yes. So. Um, a couple of other considerations, you know, so if boxes encourage more marginal innovations, people submitting crappy ideas, hoping they get lucky, you would expect an increase in the number of applications. We looked at that both at the country and the applicant level and we find no evidence of it. Um, if anything, there's a slight negative impact, but it's not very significant. And so this worry that, okay, patent boxes are going to lead to the patent offices being flooded with mediocre ideas. We don't find much evidence of that here. Um, now, again, we don't find an impact on the number of applications. You want to be aware that other studies use different countries. Other studies will use different measures of patenting activity, uh, number of registrations, number of grant to patents only. So it, it is a different sort of, you, you have to be aware that there are differences there. The other thing is you might be worried that patent boxes might encourage people to fight longer for revise and resubmits. So when the patent office tells you, no, we're not going to grant that, you can go back and you can draft a new application, submit that one too. And you can do that in principle as many times as you want. So you can keep fighting longer and longer, hoping to wear them out so they give you the damn thing. And we find no evidence of that. And so it, it's, not, uh, it's not a revise and resubmit thing, people fighting longer so more get over the line. Because if that were true, that should show up in how long it takes for something to get granted. We find no impact there. So to wrap things up, um, patent boxes are linked to an increase in the probability of an application getting granted. It's a pretty significant impact. It's only amongst the big players. The effect's only after two years. And this really does seem to argue as the main effect being increased research effort, more novel technologies being developed and submitted to the EPO. We find maybe a bit of evidence for representative upgrading. We don't find any evidence of the system being flooded with mediocre applications. We don't find any evidence of fighting longer to give it over the line. So they do seem like they improve innovation. You know, they're better ideas to the extent that more novel ideas and therefore granted ideas are better. Um, but, you know, it, you know, applications themselves spread knowledge. There's benefit to that. But again, this really is only benefiting the big guys. And if you're worried about SMEs, this probably is not the policy for you. And it also comes at probably a pretty significant tax revenue cost. Lots of profits are being shifted. Lots of profits are being taxed less as a result of this policy. And so there are benefits to having perhaps more applications and better ideas, but there are costs as well. And it's something we want to be aware of and how the distribution of those may well vary across firms. Thank you. Thank you, Ron, for this interesting presentation. Actually, we have also some people from Austrian Patent Office and uh, Mariana is one of them, I think. And it was yeah, interesting. You terrify me, Mariana, <laughs> because I'm not a patent person. It was interesting to see in your table that Austria does not have any patent box so yeah. uh, your results were very interesting and maybe it will trigger some opinions for the Austrian government to maybe implement such a policy. So uh, I would like to ask people to uh, unmute their microphones and talk. Maybe first we can have Mariana to, to talk and then we will go one by one to the questions. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm not. A, I'm not a great expert either. I'm just running the office, you know. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, some experts from my office is is there. Well, we had a suggestion to the Austrian government. At least, yeah, 
uh, we had to try to suggest a, a patent box uh, together with the Austrian Research Promotion Agency. Our thought was that uh, in Austria, we uh, reward very well the process of innovation and research. We have um, big promotion activities and invest a lot of money in that. But um, we do not reward the output side, you know. So we have a, a lot of input support, but no output support. So that was uh, the question. But um, I think um, um, I was hoping for the SMEs to get more benefit out of, out of patent boxes. Obviously, you have to have some other incentives for the SMEs to use it. Right. Um, or to bring about um, better innovation. What I also ask myself, uh, if it is uh, 5% of the most innovative big companies um, who uh, have the most effect from these patent boxes, but those companies are also those who are more successful with their innovation anyway, because they put more money into research, they have some um, experience in that and so on. Isn't it a kind of adverse selection in there? So uh, sort of two, two responses. So with the last one, um, you know, that's why I like this. This is our sort of main result here where we're using the applicant fixed effects. So relative for, for me as a company, relative to my average across time, once that box comes into play, I do better. Okay. You know, and so, you know, and, and it's not like when the box comes into play, I would move from the bottom 95 to the top five. It's the same group throughout, throughout mm -hmm. the time. Um, yeah. And, but this is the, in terms of the SMEs, this is again, the opposite of a subsidy. So the B index, the higher the B index, the less subsidies and mm -hmm. whoever developed it, why they made it that way, which makes it so hard to explain. That, that, that's not me. Um, but what it suggests is subsidizing the upfront costs matter for the little guys, not the big guys. And so what I, I think it really does come back to the fact that if I want to do r and I got to buy a lab, I got to pay some scientists for a few years before maybe I get lucky and have an innovation worth trying to patent. Those upfront costs seem to be the barriers for the small players. And that's, you know, if the Austrian government is putting a lot of money into bringing the B index low, that's actually probably going to be a more effective policy in our estimates to promoting activity among the SMEs. Mm -hmm. okay. But in this way, in this way that Austria does not have patent box, in this way, large companies are not taking good advantage as other countries in the European Union take, so. And they are gonna be your major um, innovators. Well, yeah. Just as to bring it back to a trade idea, you know, one, so what it says is, okay, promising lower taxes on income down the line. You know, if you can make income down the line bigger, which when we look at pentatic patents where you submit it to all five of the big offices, we do find it a positive effect of the patent box, even for the small innovators. So if you wanted to pair a patent box with export promotion, which I don't know whether that would be legal under state aid within the EU, that's a whole nother set of issues. Um, something like that to help you market and, and actually um, implement the innovation a, as a revenue generating stream. Mm. That might be another way to, to go if you wanted mm. to use the patent box to promote even the small guys. Yeah. What, but, what we do have in Austria, um, if you're interested, I mean, yeah, uh, I, I am. Um, we do have um, two kinds of um, support. We have a direct promotion support to the companies and institutions and universities um, for their um, research activities. Um, some bottom up, so you can apply as you go, and some top down in terms of programs, for example, for the for the COVID vaccine and so on. Um, and the other, the other kind is indirect support, which is a tax support. So it's a cost reduction um, of, um, I think, 15% of the costs um, of your innovation in the country. 
It's also a kind of nexus approach, mm -hmm. which helps um, big enterprises as well and um, to persuade their mothers to put uh, innovation activities into Austrian daughters, for example. Right. So we have this too, and I think it's a question of a right mix of activities, but both of them, they reward the process, the input, but not the output. Right. We, do, yeah. we do not have any more measures to reward the output of innovation, you know, bringing this research into the market. Yeah. So that's why I think patent boxes are quite interesting for us. Yes. So just to follow up on that, based off something Marty and I were talking about, like right now, you know, Biden is talking about a global minimum tax for US multinationals. And the OECD has been banging this drum for a while and maybe something will happen, maybe it won't. Personally, I'm fairly pessimistic. But even if they do, what you're talking about, increasing the incentives to bring it here and do it locally, that's just going to be the new tax competition. Mm -hmm. And you know, yes. it's you know, shutting it down one place doesn't stop the incentive to attract FDI or especially high value innovative activities. Because one of the things we see is the spillovers from R and D are remarkably local. You know, the, ha the half-life is something like 167 kilometers or something ridiculous. And so, you know, there's, I just think it's going to shift where that competition happens. Austria is very rich in multinational enterprises that have their supply chains across Eastern Europe, ac across Balkans, across Asia. So I think a, a patent box could be a good solution for them to take back those production facilities to Austria. <laughs> but uh, yeah. yeah, it's just a guess. Yeah, yeah so I, I think I, I, Mariana is still with us, so we can still uh, get her insights. And thank you, Mariana, for joining us. It's very good. Uh, we didn't send out the invitation directly to you, but I'm really happy that you are here. I so, found you myself, and I'm very happy about that. <laughs> Great paper and very interesting discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ron. So still we have uh, some other questions from William and from Gerald. So William, if you can. Yeah, hello, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, I'm, uh, I'm at the University of Rijeka in Croatia. Oh. Uh, not now, right now I'm in uh, Toronto, Canada and Buffalo, New York. <laughs> stuck here. Say you didn't sound like a native Croat. No, well, I can speak a little bit, but uh, I'm really from Western New York and in Southern Ontario there. Okay. Uh, uh, but I, I'm doing, uh, I, I've been in the automotive industry for quite a while. And as you probably know, uh, that's gaining a lot of interest among uh, even financial journalism these days in yeah. terms of how innovation is spreading with battery technology and different kind of propulsion. Uh, portfolios that are being granted to the marketplace. I'm wondering uh, if you look at the production function in, in automotive, it's really radically changed in the last 20 to 30 years uh, with more services added and less actual hard uh, core production. And they mate them together. And I'm wondering how patent boxes have uh, in some way maybe uh, changed kind of the mix between services and hardcore capital goods. So there are sort of two aspects to that. So one aspect of it is that some patent boxes cover copyrights. Um, so sort of IP more broadly than patents alone. Um, others don't, but increasingly they, they seem to be headed in that direction. And so, you know, services may not have a patent to go with it, but have some other sort of IP protection. And so they, they would do the exact same thing. Um, but the other thing is just when I think services, I think more broadly about intangibles. And you know, the, a lot of intangible softwares actually end up being patented. Um, where are my robustness checks? Here we are, um, by technology class. So uh, certain technology classes, uh, electricity in particular, is I think where software shows up. Um, and so we actually find that that's actually where we get one of the bigger bumps. And so patent boxes do seem to increase software. So Ryan, one of the co-authors, he actually was a patent lawyer before he you know, became my PhD student and I beat him down. Um, and so now he's going to go back and be a patent lawyer. <laughs> uh, he, did, he is graduating. It's not like I broke the boy. Um, but 
And so that, that's one of the things he suspects is that we might be finding that because software is something that you can actually move pretty quickly on. And so some of the other stuff that Ryan and I and some of our co-authors have done is uh, we looked at AI patents and where those are located. And one of the biggest hot spots for AI in Europe is Munich. Why? Because it's all being done by the automotive industry for self-driving cars. So yeah, uh, that's uh, that's interesting. Um, you mentioned also uh, uh, lawyers having a good team of lawyers from uh, I guess a major type yeah. of a firm. Uh, as you know, these days in the U.S. and in Canada, not only lawyers. Uh, well, I, I guess lawyers have been kind of upstaged by judges. So I was wondering what kind of judge would be granting these patents uh, in the system and so, what their background is. Yeah, so when we do this, so we have representative success. The EPO does not tell you who the, there's a different name for it that you're supposed to use now, but I call them patent officers. It's like an old, that's the old fashioned name. Um, the, the US will tell you who the patent officer was on a particular application. And so people have looked at them. There's one paper, I can't remember who it is, but they look at how much experience matters. Um, more experienced patent officers are actually much more likely to grant an application. You know, just like those who operate in academic circles, you get a grad student as a referee on a paper, you're screwed. They reject everything. It's the old people like me who are like, yeah, that's a cool idea. I think you could change this, that, and the other, but. Um, and the other thing that comes out is, when, even as people move up in the ranks of admin, they still do review some applications. And when they have other stuff to do, that actually makes, a, it, it changes whether or not they grant applications. I think it makes them more forgiving because it's a lot easier to say fine, yes, than no. Um, if you look at the paper or if you email me, I can tell you exactly what that paper was that did look at that. There's a small literature. Um, but we didn't want to use the US Patent Office because of the home bias issue. And with the European Patent Office, we have a lot of different countries, some with boxes, some without, but a single central decision-making body. Right, now, and I will email you because I find it uh, quite interesting. If you could send me the slides too, that would be great. Absolutely, they are gonna put the slides up, but email me, I'll send you the paper, I'll send you the appendix, I'll send you everything. That's great. Now, one other point I had is uh, back around 2000 to 2002, uh, Toyota came out with the Prius, which was the first successful hybrid vehicle in the market. And literally about two to three years after they launched the Prius, they sold their hybrid technology to Nissan uh, for their Altima. And they came out with the Altima hybrid around 2007, which used the Prius system. So I guess, uh, maybe Toyota already benefited greatly from their patent box to be able to just allow them to uh, shop the market, you know, with their system and give it to someone else. Right. So what I, I, and I don't know the answer to this is, does qualifying income only count for the car I make with the technology? Or if I rent you the technology, if I license the technology to you, collect royalties on that, does it cover that as well? And I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. If anything, I would guess it varies by by the box. Right, but they probably also, uh, maybe they've already made their big tax hit on yeah. the application and then said, well, you know, what the hell, you know, let's just shop it out there because we already made our, made our money. Yeah, they may well be. Or they came up with the next generation, so sell that one on, you know. Yeah. Marty and I were talking about my guitars in the background. You know, when, I, <laughs> when, when I buy a, a new fancier guitar, first, my wife yells at me. But second, you know, maybe I unload one of the older ones that bit beat up around the edges. Oh. Yeah, and I don't know the answer to that. It's a hybrid guitar. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you, Ron, and thank you, William, for your uh, comment. So Gerald is also, I think, from Austrian Patent Office. Am I right? Thank you very much, yes. Thank you for your very insightful and interesting presentation and explanations. I'm a lawyer at the Austrian Patent Office. My question would be, how have the OECD rules, Nexus-based approach, affected the success rate of patent applications compared to the old 
patent boxes without nexus approach. So the I have a really hard time answering that. And the reason why is basically all of the new boxes have nexus requirements. Okay. It's only a couple of hold out the old ones that don't. But the problem I run into is, you know, I don't know how much econometrics you know, but I'm controlling for the fact that this is an application from France. And so to identify an impact here, I need variation on the patent box in France, but it never varied. And so statistically, I can't tell is, is it just France or is the patent box in France, which there's no variation in. So All it means the, the success rate the in- data is right here. So it also means that the success rate of patents in France is much lower, that's, that's negative. It's not significant. Um, and where is my list of countries? So the success rate of France is about 55%, oops, which is about spot on the sample mm -hmm. average. Um, Germany is a little bit better. You know, Ireland, a little bit worse. Um, so for those unaware, I, I live in Ireland now. Um, Austria yeah. is 60%. Yes, yeah, so Austria is a pretty good one. Malta is ridiculously high. Um, but you know, I, well, I think that's simply, Malta has only got 277 applications in the data. Um, so, yeah, so, so what, I, I wouldn't, what was I wouldn't, again the Nexus uh, base approach? So the Nexus says, if you want the tax cut, you have to do at least X percentage of the R&D costs here. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be, it, it could be a percent or it could be an amount, at least a hundred, whatever. Um, and you're, you're saying all of the new patent boxes, they already have Nexus one. Yeah. Cause the OECD was essentially worried about, well, you're just going to do your R and D wherever, and then sell the patent to your foreign affiliate in a country with a non Nexus box, mm -hmm. giving you a legitimate reason to shift profits there. And so it was an attempt to shut down that very blatant profit shifting. Mm -hmm. and, and what so, is you know, the minimum? What's, what's the concern then you just shift where you do your r d and yes that there are papers out there that do seem to find that it shifts where you do your r d mm -hmm. and how yeah. much should be the minimum share of the r d is it variable across? varies by country i only know the irish one off the top of my head and it's 70 percent okay so i see thank interesting. you very much. interesting yeah. yeah thank you gerald and Thomas, would you like to unmute yourself? And yes, hi. Um, hi. Also, um, hi, Ron. Um, hey, how are you, man? <laughs> I'm great. Um, thanks for the um, great presentation, um, as always. Um, I was thinking about um, your statement about um, mediocre um, applications. Um, so how do you measure um, patent quality? We don't. Okay. That, that's key. So what we are able to do, some stuff we can measure that you might think of is quality. Um, so the number of codes. Now, this is actually probably more complexity. The more uh, CPC codes on a claim or on, on an application, the worse you tend to do, although the effect is pretty small. And basically, if it's really complex, it seems to be a little harder to get over the line statistically. Mm -hmm. Um, the number of claims, both overall and independent of the prior uh, independent claims, um, there's not a whole lot of an impact there statistically. Um, the number of inventors uh, doesn't seem to have a huge impact here. Um, the number of citations, forward citations seem to matter. You might be worried about endogeneity. We did leave it out, doesn't change anything. But the whole idea is if I could measure novelty directly, that would be my dependent variable. And then I would ask whether patent boxes increase novelty, but I can't. The idea here is that unobserved novelty is correlated with patent box. And that is, dry, that is what's driving this effect. Patent box increases novelty, which then increases the probability it gets granted. Mm -hmm. That's the approach that we're taking. Okay, so it's so the only one I can think of that tried to go after novelty directly is Ernst et al. Uh, I think it was an ITAX paper. Where'd he go? There we are. Uh, yeah, 2014 ITAX. So they create a, a, a quality index. So they use principal component analysis and they boil down forward citations. I want to say family size, so the number of offices um, and something else. 
only for granted patents. And they look at whether patent boxes increase that index of novelty they create. And, and it's, it's the family size, it's forward citations, and it might be number of claims is the third thing. I can't remember what the three things were. Yeah, in the PCA. Exactly. So it's okay. So it's not a, it's not a focus of your analysis um, here in terms of um, this more or less um, the social um, impact in order um, to address the question of um, do we really desire um, this additional um, baggage um, for for um, for the uh, patent and, um, offices. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, the one that we don't find any evidence that it's flooding the offices with additional applications. Um, again, you know, we're only looking at companies. We're only looking at what comes out of EPO countries. Um, so, you know, it, it is a somewhat different sample than what has been used elsewhere. Um, see if I can find that. So, you know, there, it, but there could be more applications coming in from the US, Japanese applicants, you know, these guys can patent in the EPO too, but we exclude them from the sample straight away because of that home bias concern. Maybe maybe one one last question that um, yeah. regard in terms of um, at least um, addressing the quality of the applications. Um, do you um, consider um, measures um, beyond this um, success rates um, of the lawyers um, in order to determine um, how much effort is really going um, into um, this application process? Or maybe um, whether um, are there more inventors involved or more classifications um, for, the, for the patents um, may, being made? Um, so we, we treat those as explanatory variables. So the, the number of inventors, the number of claims, we're assuming, so we're, we're not looking at how patent boxes affect those. Ryan does have interest in doing a follow-up study, looking at the number of claims. So basically, you know, you can have one big idea with five claims, or you could submit five different applications. And as long as one of those guys get through, that gives me some place to attribute the income and therefore I can take advantage of the box, but we have not gone that route in this paper. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. So Good it question is for, for you, where are you now? Are you still in Germany or are you in Norway? <laughs> um, Max is in Norway. Um, I'm in Germany um, okay. with um, a little bit in Munich. Okay. Yeah. I couldn't, I didn't remember if it was you or Max who went to Norway. Anyway, weatherwise you probably chose better. <laughs> It's at least less rainy here. <laughs> <laughs> so Ron, uh, it's like you control for the novelty with other variables like claims. So the change of quality or novelty of the patent is controlled by these variables. And on top of that, the patent box plays an additional role, right? Yeah, but there's still, you know, what, what is novelty? Uh, yeah. that, that's that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. I mean, could and, you and, and, maybe that, make that's an exactly the question. out of it? Yeah. So, you know, th there's something undefinable. You know it when you see it. I mean, that's what people like Gerald did, right? You know, you, you know it when you see it. But my point is, maybe you can make an index out of these and out of your fitted value of the variable and make an index on the novelty of the patent. If it is granted, it is, of course, very novel. And yeah. maybe the distance from the... I don't know, something like this. We, we've thought about that, but lately it seems that uh, PCA analysis is coming under a bit of fire. Usually it's like one thing drives almost all of it. And so okay. I'm, a, I'm a little bit hesitant to go that route. You know? and, but yeah, you know, novelty is novelty. Like, so we've submitted this paper twice so far and we've gotten desk rejected both times. Once <laughs> at the AER and once at Restud. And you know, there, there's response was, well, it's not general interest. I don't know how to measure general <laughs> interest. You know, it's, it's in the eye of the beholder to a degree. But and, maybe you know, we can control for lots of stuff. How long is my paper? How many, you know, papers do I reference? How many tables do I have? But it's still <laughs> that undefinable juice that, that, that's important. And that undefinable juice, we are assuming, following up on Thomas's question, is sort of the patent box is correlated with the undefinable juice, which in the model is this idea of research effort, which is shifting the distribution of novelty. 
And you control for the cost of efforts. Uh, we don't because we don't know that much about the firm. Mm -hmm. We know the name of the applicants. Now you could in theory try to take this, uh, go to the JRC down in Sevilla, match this with the R&D scoreboard um, to come up with a proxy for R&D costs. But we, we have not gone that route. Um, Orbis is not a successful one because yeah, it has or missing. Orbis is even worse. So, mm -hmm. yeah, William, I think has another question. William, I just wanted to know if you specifically have the data for the automotive industry as a whole, meaning the uh, ones in the upstream and the midstream, the OEMs and the uh, tier one parts manufacturers. So our data, what we're doing is we're pulling off of the patents, the applicant, um, where do you go? So we're, we're pull, pulling that off as the owner of the patent. Um, now, some of those, you could probably take the name and come up with an automotive industry. Um, if you are interested in that, and remind me when you email me. So Annette Altstader and her co-authors are looking at patent boxes and registrations of granted patents in the EPO. So how many countries do I register my patent across Europe once it's been granted by the EPO as a function of whether I'm in a patent box? And they look specifically at automotive um, software, I think, and pharmaceuticals. So, you know, one could in theory pull that out. We would have to do it by name, um, but then to allocate them to midstream, upstream, downstream. Yeah, that, that's definitely outside of my Mount House. Thank you. Uh, I didn't see also some raised hands. So uh, Konstantin has also a question. Yulia has also a question or comment. So Konstantin. Uh, thanks, Saran. Um, besides from the research effort you're picking up, I was wondering to what extent could uh, you pick up diversion effects, right? If I'm a, say, German company and I used to file um, I used to file my pa patents uh, previously from my German firm. Um, now that Ireland has a has a um, patent box, maybe I decide to file it through my subsidy in Ireland, right? And I, of course, I have a resource uh, research office there, and uh, maybe that would also be consistent with the two-year time lag that you're mentioning, because. I think for research, I mean, I don't know how you how you're doing, but two two years is quite quick, right? To pick up in terms of research uh, productivity. So I was uh, wondering, maybe you could control for that, right? You could uh, estimate something like uh, the like the effect for non-patent uh, countries. I, I'm not sure how to exactly do that, but uh, probably you could include that. So because we're restricting ourselves just to Europe, I would worry about losing what. BMW might be doing in Mexico, for example, or the US, right? Um, but yeah, it would give firms an incentive to reallocate where their research efforts are, which projects they, they really focus on. The best person to answer that is Tomas, because he and Max have a paper where you are, if I remember, you, you directly look for this spillover effect on R&D across countries as patent boxes come into play. Exactly. So we are looking at um, what what happens in um, other countries um, within the multinational um, network um, once one of the affiliates um, gains access um, to the um, patent box. And it's exactly the effect you're talking about, Constantine. So, and you know that that's where the whole nexus box comes into play again, right? So. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, maybe in your regression, you could put in something like, I don't know, the effects, like instead of having a patent, right, you have patent box, and maybe you have something like a, a measure for not patent box, which is weighted by the closeness of where the patent box is in an economic sense, right? That could give you some diversion effects, but I'm not sure yeah. exactly how to I do mean, that. I mean, if it's fairly stable across time, it would be captured by our applicant fixed effects. So, but it's worth thinking about. Cool, thanks. Yeah, that's that's nice. So it's it's like um, a, a distance weighted patent box or spatial patent box around the patentees, which also changes over time. Yeah, it could. Um, 
Right, it would shift at the margin, right? I'm BMW in Munich and yeah, I, you know, I'm indecisive between filing the patent. I mean, the patent maybe is a collaboration anyway between some kind of some affiliate here or and, and Munich, right? And now just the, the patent box is kind of the, right, uh, the marginal game changer. So I, I file it there and it's not really a new idea. It's just Right. shifted within a company so, so you know. one of the things we do control for is whether there's an international team of inventors if there if the inventor team crosses borders um the people in the epo when we talked to them about this they said yeah that's a multinational almost certainly and so we don't actually find a significant impact for that really um now some others might we also control for whether the owner of the application and some inventor are in different countries. So trying to control for that structure, which might be a proxy for multinational activity, they aren't significant in particular once we control for the applicant fixed effects. So, you know, to the extent that that's catching some of that, but that, you know, but again, this may be a, an application that does not cross borders but some other application owned by the same applicant could, and we wouldn't be capturing that here. So do you also control for an applicant that gathers a group later and files <laughs> another patent in a group instead of a uh, single patentee? Uh, so multi-applicant applications are tossed out of the data. And we, again, we are assigning the application to an applicant based on who owns it at the time of initial submission. If it gets transferred later, that's not my, my point. Problem. My point is you may have two applicants uh, over time. The first time the applicant appeared as a single applicant, but the second time it was in a international team. Do you consider it as a... <laughs> Uh, changing international team applicant or? Uh, no, so, so this international application team is at the time of submission. If later on you revise, resubmit, add an inventor, which I don't know if that even happens, um, that, that would not change. This is at the time of initial submission. You know, in terms of sort of the, the transfer of applications across borders, um, I forget her surname, but Kiramella is her, her second name. Uh, she's sort of the one I, I, I would go to if you're really interested in where are multinational stashing their applications. And, and so she, she's the, the one that I think is probably on top of that the best. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then Yulia is also part of the Austrian Patent Office. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't see any raised hand here, maybe because I, I'm not presenting. So Yulia, please go ahead and unmute first and... Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. And also thank you for the interesting presentation. I'm uh, an economist working in data analysis at the Austin Patent Office. And uh, an issue I encounter a lot is that applicant names from paths that are quite messy. So they are typos and um, yeah. sometimes it's um, the main company and then it's a subsidiary that um, applies. So how did you encounter this issue? And if so, how did you tackle it? So that we know that this is an issue and our disambiguation um, is detailed in the paper, but basically there's a guy, Gianluca in Italy that we pay money to do this for us. The, the, he, he runs a business and this is what he does. Um, so Texas, he- Texas crapping. Uh, yeah, so like, and it's something like the, the title of the paper met, outlining his methodology is literally, is like how to kill inventors is the name of the paper that it describes <laughs> it. And so it goes through and how do you deal with this? He's the one who disambiguated the uh, applicant, the inventor, and the, the lawyer team, the, the, the represent, representation. Um, the other thing I should say is with the representative data, we're only the second paper to ever make use of that. Um, there's one other paper that did this for the US and what they did is they took the data, split it in half, calculated representative fixed effects, and then used that as a control variable in the other half of the data. And yeah, higher average success rate in half the data means higher average success rate here. 
So the answer to Yulia's question is you don't know how to fix the problem of the names of the uh, patentees when they have different wording in different countries, right? Yeah. So Gianluca you, knows about it. Uh, yeah, I don't know how, how it's done. Ryan is very much into this sort of thing. Um, so I, I have to trust my co-author and Gianluca about yeah. this so maybe maybe uh, Yulia can later c get the um, contact details of Gianluca or your yeah co let us know yeah but if you, if you pay him make sure you tell him so he gives me a tip <laughs> thank you yeah any other question uh, so William asked if it is possible to get the contact or email address of the Austrian Patent Office participants. Julia, uh, maybe if you can answer to the, because it's, so Mariana is also here. Uh, absolutely, uh, it's on the homepage. So if, if you go on uh, patentamt.at, which is a patent office, and um, then you see the names and also, yeah, sure. We're welcome to write us an email. Great, that's that's yeah. very good and useful. Sure. Yeah, I can so, actually I can give our email address in the, in the chat, right? Oh, okay, much better. Okay. So, comment or question? I have to thank all of you. It was, uh, it it became a very long. Um, seminar one and a half hours more than we expected but it was uh, very insightful i learned a lot thank you ron thank you uh, all the attendees thank you people from the austrian patent office it was really great to see you here and um, yeah we will have other seminars in a few other weeks we will have another seminar next week which will be uh, our spring seminar on 14th and after that, we will have other webinars on international economics. So feel free to join any webinar that interests you. Thank you again, Ron. And thank you, all of you. Thank you, everybody, for uh, you. comments. Take, Take care. care. Like next time, hopefully, we get to do this in real life. So. Thank you, Ron. Sure. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.